Hi everyone, Sarah Klein here. And I'm Dr. Stacy Rewell DuPont. And we wanted to do a quick wrap up video after the 2020 Integration of Yoga and Psychology Summit. First off, we really wanna thank you for taking the time to watch these videos, for being interested in this wonderful topic or topics. And we know that the people who have kind of stuck with these videos are the seekers, are the movers, are the changers of the world. Um, and as cheesy as it sounds, I really am a firm believer or the more people doing this work, diving into their yoga practices or whatever their yoga is, the better this world will be. So thank you for being a part of that community. We are so excited that you followed us through the journey. We had so much fun talking with each of our guests and really learning how they came into the work, why the work is important to them, what their line of work is and the different tangents and the different ways that people have taken their work and really taken this thing called yoga and, and spread it into their communities, their audiences, with their clients, their students and really deepening. And, and like Sarah, I think if we change ourselves, we change the circles that we influence. And as those things ripple out, we've changed the world. If I change the way I interact with my children, my children interact with the world differently. And that feeds on and on and on. A hundred years from now, what I did today in my own self-study matters. Um, so we do really thank you for being part of it and know that you're somebody who is interested in deepening your own language and your own understanding of these topics that then you can pass on into your own communities with your students and your clients. So we asked everybody as we started out the summit in our interviews is how did they come to this work? So Sarah, how did you come to this work? <laughs> um, it's a good question. I mean, I definitely vividly remember walking out of my first Ashtanga Vinyasa yoga class and I had a smile from ear to ear. And the more that I have learned and the deeper I've gone, I really can look back at that moment, whether the memory is clear or not after everything we've learned, but it really did feel like a coming home. It felt like something that, my life was um, on a path to find and return to. And through, um, through undergrad, I studied health psychology and I was always fascinated in understanding why people do what they do when they know what they know and trying to get to the root of behavioral change really in the realm of health and well-being. Um, and at that time, and really ever since um, I was little. I think I was like probably, I don't know exactly how old, but but young, I got chronic migraines and they were really crippling in the sense that whatever I had was, whatever was going on, I had to pause, I had to fall asleep. Um, doctors wanted to put me on some really intense medications that luckily my parents said no to. <laughs> um, and after a consistent yoga practice, after I found yoga in college and then really dove into my practice, I don't get migraines anymore. And I really do believe that it, it has given me the ability to manage my stress, um, to self-regulate and control my hormones in a way due to the restructuring of my nervous system. Um, so I, you know, whether it, it was just a time frame change or or the yoga, but I really do believe that it was the yoga. So that's my personal change story. It's not anything huge and dramatic, but I do feel like um, I found yoga and it was a, a coming home. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty significant one to go from regular migraine headaches to none. <laughs> yeah. Or very limited. Very it, was few. it was good. Okay, Stacy, you tell us. <laughs> Mine is also pretty serendipitous. I was an exercise science major working in a big athletic clubs and corporate fitness and refineries in South Texas. And I was teaching about 14 classes a week, a variety of different classes from boot camps and spinning to senior fitnesses, kids fitness, water aerobics. It was a lot as well as training um, like 10 clients or so. Um, and my body was tired, even though I was young and I was into it and I was really excited about it. Um, 
I started teaching what was known as the relaxation class because back then we couldn't really call it meditation. That was weird and too woo woo. And so after one of my boot camp classes, we'd take 30 minutes and like lay in the dark and I would lead through guided meditation or guide at the time guided relaxation um, for bo more bodily awareness. And it was just something that was trending and it was kind of up and coming and new in the community. And so I started with that and we had one yoga class that was taught at like 10 a.m. in this huge center. And it consisted of me at, I think I was 19 or 20 and uh, about four women who were probably, oh, they had to be at least 30 years older than me. Um, interested in it. I can't say it was a true yoga vibe learning situation. It was cool to go to yoga at that time because yoga was just this trendy thing that was happening. And um, I remember being in one of the first classes and I had the strength and flexibility to get through the class actually really well. Um, but the teacher kept pointing out that it wasn't just about the strength and flexibility. It wasn't just about pushing into these limits and it really helped me balance out my world. And like you, Sarah, I also had migraines a lot in um, my adolescent and actually was in, I was going to school or had planned to be a psychiatrist, but had this health condition that I kept getting these tests for and they could never quite figure it all out. And it was really related more to food. It still continues to be as I still manage it. Um, it's really around balancing out my nervous system and making sure that I am eating things that are not harming me, um, which sometimes can be really hard in our culture. So yoga and and then eventually as I found my way into psychology because my person I so I ended up in exercise science because the medicine was trying to put me on heavy drugs and I kept saying that's not what I need and I really want to do this from a proactive stance and I got really into health and fitness and diet and exercise as a way to heal my own system and then ended up in exercise science but my clients kept crying and so there was something in me that drew out something in them that was really significant. And I went back to school for psychology and ended up in somatic psychology where I could meld in the body systems with the mind and with the psychology theories and interventions. And yoga was the entry point for me to learn that, oh, this is how it comes together. I could feel it tangibly in my system. And I started teaching yoga in like 2000, I think right around two, 2000 or so, um, and was m kind of moving away from that as I got more into my psychology program. And I, I really didn't have the time to continue to teach a class or two a week as I got busier um, with businesses and, and things that I was doing in, in my other life areas but I continue to take classes on a very regular basis because it was a grounding force that if I take the class, I will show up at home. I will show up on my mat at home and, and really kind of going through that process. And it is part of what keeps me on track for the health and well-being that I need to be successful and the energy levels that I need to be successful. So yoga is a big deal. And whatever you call your yoga, it's a big deal. And I've watched it really work well with many, many, many people over the course of my 30 year career in health and fitness and wellness. Um, and, and now my last decade with mental health. So as we, we talked with everybody over the course of the, the summit, we also were asking them, what is yoga to them? So what is yoga, Sarah? You are our yoga guru right here. So I think, you know, it, I'm so glad we get the opportunity to kind of wrap this up. And, and it, Bhavani really articulated this so beautifully, um, saying that, you know, everybody's going to answer this question a little bit differently. And, and that's okay. But it, let's actually get down to what does the literature say yoga is so that we can put our rudder in the right position. So we start paddling in the right direction. Um, and I am a firm believer that whatever brings you to yoga and whatever your yoga is, ultimately the yoga starts to do you and it starts, the philosophy starts to become obvious. Um, and that's why it's such a beautiful practice because it is this embodied practice where ultimately the, the wisdom is revealed within 
the consistency of the practice. But what is yoga? Yogas chitta vritti nirodaha. And let's talk about that. Let's break that down. So that's Yoga Sutra 1.2, potentially very clearly states what yoga is. Yogas chitta, which this is something that we have touched on in a couple of these interviews. It means to collect. And it's thought of as our energetic field. And it is every experience that we have been a part of, even deeper than that, every thought that we have had. And we got to talk very briefly on the fascinating topic of epigenetics, where actually science is showing that it's not even just our own stuff that's in there, but it's also the stuff that's been handed down um, from our lineage. So everything, so yoga is Yoga's chitta vritti means the whirling and the twirling, the chatter, <laughs> um, and then ni rodaha to <laughs> to still, to find ease within it. And so essentially, um, here we get the opportunity to dive into what is consciousness and how we can use the system of the body to ultimately nirodaha the never ending patterns of the mind. And I wanted to bring up um, this research study, which Bhavani also referenced in her, in her video. And I've heard her talk a lot about, and it's from Harvard where, you know, this isn't, you know, it, it ebbs and flows, but there's about 80,000 thoughts that the average human has in a day. 80,000 thoughts. And 95% of those thoughts are reoccurring. <laughs> They're just on a loop. And then here's the kicker. 80% of those thoughts are maladaptive. They're self-limiting. And so what potentially says is, okay, this is the human condition. You're not getting around this. This is what the state of, or the nature of the mind is. But we have the ability to wake up through these practices. And why would we want to do yoga? So if yoga is being able to wade through the context of the mind so that we ultimately can see what is the true self, who is the seer of the mind? And then what are the thought patterns and are they true? Are they real? Are they running the ship? Are they maladaptive? Um, and if we're in that state of yoga where we can discern between that, then we live in our brilliance. That's the next sutra. Tada drashtahu swarupe vashtanam. If we are able to find a millisecond of clarity that we label in this practice as yoga, then we are in our true nature. We are in our brilliance. Um, and that is essentially why we do yoga so that we can live in a state of joy, of unwavering joy. And then another research study I was actually just reading um, before we got on the phone, Stacy, um, also came out of Harvard and it was titled something along the lines of the wavering mind is the unhappy mind. And they studied thousands of people through um, an app and multiple times throughout the day, they would have them check in on if they were present in the moment, what they were doing and their level of joy. And they showed that it actually didn't matter what they were doing. So if you were doing the thing that you dislike the most, so maybe it's like vacuuming or maybe it's like accounting. <laughs> and if you're actually present and you're fully present in the moment, your level of happiness is much higher. So your happiness is independent of that which you are doing, but totally dependent on your your ability to focus. And that ultimately is what yoga gives us is it gives us the tools. It gives us the techniques to, um, to use our system in the proper way to train it, uh, so that we can live in our joy. Right. And like the, the, and from a psychology perspective, we would say, you know, life is really only 10% what happens to you. 90% of it is about how you perceive what's happening to you. We have stories of people who have survived horrific events, horrible traumas, um, have very, very difficult life paths. 
And those that are able to turn the mind in the direction of what is working, the present moment, am I safe right now, this moment that I'm in? And can I say yes? If not, how can I get safe? And then take some sort of action in that moment. Those are the ones who are the most healthy, even if their story is really, really awful. They are the ones who've been able to turn the mind towards what is working, what was um, successful, where they had a little bit of agency, even if their level of control was really, really small or, or not, not very much at all. They could control how they thought. Right. And that's a really big deal. And as our mind whirls, you know, there's a great quote, and I'm forgetting who says it, that just says, you know, your thoughts become, your beliefs become your thoughts, become your actions, becomes your character. Really yeah, someone, someone very important said that. <laughs> and that. When we break that down in just the tangible piece, it's exactly what you were saying in the sutras, that if I'm going to have a thought, which we know creates a chemical electrical vibrational change in the physical structure of the body, that goes out beyond me. Waves travel beyond me. So electricity is waves, vibration is waves, think sound waves, light waves. Those are waves. They travel out beyond my physicality. The chemistry of my body that's shooting through my neurological structures, that's moving from neuron to neuron and across the synapses, those are changing those vibrational states of my atoms in the way that my cells are responding to each other just in my structure of matter. And so as those change, it's changing with every thought and emotion that I have. It's creating pathways. We know the brain likes to be very efficient, so it likes to do its thing over and over. And until we can really take that step and step back from it and say, what is really going on for me? We continue to operate as though everything we've ever been taught is real and it's the absolute and it's the only way because it's all we know. When in reality, there's a thousand choices at any given point. To choose something means to decide, kill, kill off all other choice. So side as that root of that word. When I'm choosing something based just on the, the way I've always been taught, on rote, memory, on reactionary pieces, which we've talked about in a couple of the, the sessions in the summit, I don't have a lot of choice at that moment. All I'm doing is reacting based on the way it's always been, on those neurological pathways that are very, very strong and solid. And really what yoga allows us to do is gives us another vehicle. And as a somatic psychologist to go, and I've also been trained cognitively in cognitive theory and cognitive psychologies as well. Those theories, they're what we call top down. They take longer to get the message through because we have to break those neuro pathways. There's a lot of repetition and a lot of revisiting and reframing and, and working around where when we feel it and have an experience in the body, the experience changes the way we then know something. Mm -hmm. So if I get burned on a, st a hot stove, I instantly know not to do that again. And yoga allows us a way to be in the body, to have the experience, to change the way that the neurostructure is so tightly wound in the system mm -hmm. and gives me a new way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. And so when we talked about... Um, about those structures within with a couple of the sessions, it was really fun for me to hear it from the different perspectives. You know, we had Rachel um, Collins talking about what it was like in the intersubjective field and really working as a somatic psychology professor and teaching people how to relate to each other through this thing called the soma, the living body, that then becomes a vehicle for communication that's out in the world that we have, that we're able to connect with other people on and come back to our present moment, which then makes us happier and more joyful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so bringing up a couple, um, <laughs> okay, <thank you. laughs> mom life, <laughs> do you want to be safe? <laughs> um, 
So a couple, you know, to tie in a couple of the things that you just brought up um, from the yoga standpoint, which is a word that we did touch on in the summit is the samskaras. And essentially what yoga is saying is that every experience that we have creates a, a groove. And the more that we repeat that habit or that train of thought or that way of being, the deeper the groove is. And ultimately when that's suppressed, we don't even know that we're, we're respond or reacting in that way because we're unconscious on that and so yoga is giving us this opportunity to wake up so that we can reveal our conditioned living so that we have more choice in how we show up in the world and so to take that and how we integrate it into our yoga practice is we sit in these postures that are highly uncomfortable. And what that does is it creates heat. And in that discomfort, when the body starts shaking, we start getting hot physically, it's our tapas, our fire. Um, we can start to use that container of the posture to observe how the mind works in those very uncomfortable moments. And then the biology starts to come in where we're in this very uncomfortable pose and then we're taught to focus our eyes to deepen the rhythm of the breath and all that trains the nervous system to turn on and turn off and turn on and turn off and then ultimately with enough practice and enough consistency we take that experience it gets rooted into our subconscious and then when we're in that very uncomfortable conversation with somebody we we love we have the ability to navigate our nervous system instead of our nervous system navigating the situation. Right. Um, and do you want to add to that? And then I wanted to segue into 1.4. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yes. Because we talked about the polyvagal theory. We talked about the window of tolerance in a couple of the different summit sessions. And from a psychology perspective, the window of tolerance is how I can manage stress. Some of us have little narrow, very, very, we're very sensitive people. So we feel like oysters without a shell out in the world. So going to the grocery store, driving home, um, getting on and off the subway, we feel like everything is coming at us and we have to be so vigilant and so on that we're always being what we call tipped over or tipped out of our window. Then there's others of us who have a, a wider window when we're doing any sort of self-growth, we're always on those edges of the discomfort. In order for us to truly expand and to learn our own abilities and limits, we're hitting into those things that are not comfortable for us. And so when we're in that posture, that's really hard for me to do. And I'm witnessing myself telling myself how awful I am or how stupid this is or that that other person does it better than me or what's wrong with me. I have an opportunity to truly stay present to my thoughts because now my body is the container for this discomfort and for holding the stillness of the moment to witness it. So I have this vehicle, this container to be able to truly work with what's going on in my mind and how that's feeling in my body and those connection pieces. And as you mentioned, we're turning on and off the nervous system, which happens through our breath. So as we breathe, our inhale turns on the sympathetic, kind of that creative, the thinking, the, the wanting of, of activity, the fun, the excitement for me. If it's in a place of tipped over the fight and flight where I feel like I have to either flee or I better get ready because we're about to bring it on, or I'm going to be on the lower end where I get, it gets to be too much and I end up lethargic. I end up what we call in hypoarousal, which is that feigning of death or a hypoarousal freezel in the nervous system, which is very, very, very taxing on the system. And so as I am going through the process of, of breathing, inhaling, I have an opportunity to tap into my sympathetic in a healthy way without moving into hyper or hypoarousal. And as I exhale, I turn on that parasympathetic, the rest and digest, the stay and play, that part that allows for connection and social engagement, which is what we are as, as animal creatures. We really need that and our world needs that. 
That's where our yoga becomes what happens in the world and makes a difference is if I can stay present between my nervous system states and I have a nice window of tolerance and I'm able to stay in my parasympathetic and feel the fun of my sympathetic and feel the fun of my parasympathetic, you know, turning on creativity, resting, playing, resting, you know, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Then when I go grocery shopping, I am much kinder to the people in my community. I smile more at the people that I pass. I say hello. And when I do that, I get a hit of dopamine and oxytocin, and so does the other person I smile at. When they smile at me, even if I don't smile first, I get that too. And so now I'm bringing that home to my children, to my family, to my friends. I'm engaging in those places, dopamine being the pleasure hormone, oxytocin, the bonding one, serotonin contentment. I'm in that world of feeling good, of feeling connected. When I do that, I'm more creative. I'm more engaged. I'm more able to solve problems successfully. I'm more able to engage in relationship in healthy ways that grow all of these relationships. And it becomes a big deal. It becomes something that our world desperately needs right now is my ability to show up in a nervous system state that's contained, that feels comfortable, that's engaged, that's happy, that's joyful, and that's connected in a healthy way to draw other people in and to be able to give back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. We desperately need that in our culture. Yeah. So to kind of like loop, loop a little bit, um, but essentially we, we labeled, well, what is yoga and, and why do we want to practice, right? So we can live in our inner brilliance. We can live in our joy. We can show up in bigger ways in our community. You're just speaking on that, Stacey. Then what happens if we're not in a state of yoga and potentially very clearly states that vritti sarupyam itarahatra, when we're not in a state of yoga, the vrittis we project out onto everybody around us. And we also believe that they are the truth. So that's when we're unable to wade between what is the true self, who is the seer of the thoughts, and what are the thoughts. And then when we kind of get mushed up in it, we think we are the thoughts. We think we are the self-limiting beliefs. We think we are, what was that, 80% of the thoughts that are self-limiting that are happening and when we that's when kind of um what we talked a lot about with dr joanna um la Prade is that that's the world of the subconscious and it potentially goes really deep into that um and i really just also wanted to point out on this kind of wrap up um i think that so often when we're talking about the vrittis and we're talking about um, the suppressed world or the, the shadow sides, we often paint this really dark picture. Um, and I really like how she brought up that within that is also, what can also reside there is our brilliance. So we can also suppress that which is our unique gift. Um, and so, you know, as we're kind of, you know, just bouncing off of each other, Stacy and I, and these are really, really big topics here. And, um, you know, we, Stacy and I have put together a program that is really designed for the yoga teacher, the coach, the mental health practitioner, who is looking to understand these, co these, um, concepts in an organized fashion because i know for me as my you know arc of learning uh just listening to these interviews is very insightful but then it's like how do you take that which we're talking about and that which all of our amazing guests were talking about how do we first integrate them into our own personal practice which which is absolutely where it begins and then next how do i integrate that into the work that i that i do in the world how do i bring that to my yoga class how do i bring that to my yoga one-on-one -on -one client how do i bring it to my um my patient or my nutrition coach or um client or whatever it might be um and so basically in our program we have taken these these big topics broken them down in that order where first we really believe that what yoga is asking is for us to take a hundred percent self-responsibility for our stuff and that's that's hard and that's like that's like a really big glass of water <laughs> it's 
really hard. And so many people coming into my office struggle with that projection, that blame, that shame, the rights, the wrongs, the goods, the shoulds, all those judgment words that where they're really um, maybe misinterpreting themselves as a belief pattern. This is what my culture believes. This is what my community believes. Therefore, it is the right thing. Well, in reality, there's a lot of right things. And right is relative and wrong is relative. And it has to do with where we sit on different belief patterns, on systems, on the way that we want to live. And those are all choices we can make. And if I know what is going on inside of me, it makes it easier for me to tap into my shadow side and say, oh, is this something that needs to come forward? Is this something that needs to be healed? Is this something that I need to bring forward and out and it's uncomfortable for me because maybe it hits up against a cultural learning or something and be able to really explore that. And it always starts with us. We can only take our students and our clients and our patients as far as we go ourselves. Doesn't mean I have to have had a methamphetamine addiction in order to be able to work with that, but I better be pretty clear about looking at my own addictive behavior. Because otherwise, when somebody's with me, and Sarah, you and I have had a lot of conversations about this as, um, you know, we've talked about training yoga teachers, where it's how do you train the yoga teacher to be prepared for whatever shows up in the room? Because that student comes in and they're kind of handing you their dreams. They're handing you this, I really want something to change. Can you help me? And how do you meet that where it is? If you haven't taken yourself on and done some self-study, their vulnerability is gonna hit your vulnerability and you're gonna squash that. Have you ever been in a situation where somebody goes, oh, I, you know, you're crying and you're obviously upset and you're sharing some vulnerability and somebody's like, oh, but you really have, like you really have a great life. Or, oh, here's a tissue, like here, here you go. Like wrap it up, put it back together. I'm uncomfortable with your discomfort and I just want you to be happy. You know, some of us had parents like that who really just wanted us to be happy and fed us whatever it was. And then we came out in the world and said, oh, crap, the world isn't that nice to me. The world is full of things that are hard that I now have to deal with. And I need to look at me first because I am not sad. That's not true. I am someone who might be feeling sad, but I am not identified as that emotion. I have lots of emotions sometimes at the same time. So yoga gives us that ability to step back from whatever that yoga practice is, whether it's how I'm making my breakfast, whether it's actually showing up on the mat and doing asana, whether it's a meditation practice, whether it's the way that I'm using, you know, either right action or right speech or something like that to really show up fully as me in the world, because I know I'm separate from the one who sees. I'm the, the one who sees and I'm the one who's experiencing at the same time. Yeah, and so really kind of the intention for um, one, to bring this work out into the world, um, to share this summit, and then ultimately to do the continuing education work of the course that Stacey and I have created is to offer, you know, from my standpoint as a yoga teacher and somebody who trains teachers, I find that um, depending on how you choose to position yourself, you can either open minds through the practice or you can really close them very quickly. Um, and so for me, I have chosen to really understand the science behind yoga because our Western mind, and I see this in myself, right, is um, drawn towards research base. It's part of our culture. We want to understand why something works and how it works. And we want um, evidence-based research that shows us. And right, I, I, you know, any of the, us yogis out here, we don't necessarily need that because hello, we've felt it. We felt it on a cellular level. Um, but really to allow yoga to have the, the impact on the globe that, um, of course, I drink the Kool-Aid and I think it should and really to like lift the vibration and happiness of humanity that it has the power to do when we have the ability to articulate clearly why yoga works, we can bring yoga into our Western model. We can teach people who might be a little more closed minded or maybe bring yoga into, you know, hospital settings, which is happening. I mean, you talked about this with Michelle. I've worked in hospital settings. We can bring it into clinics. Um, and so really part of the program is to empower 
um, the yoga teacher, if that's why you're choosing to come to this program, so that you have a deeper language for sharing this. And also to integrate that into your own life. So to articulate your experience more clearly. Um, and then from the mental health practitioner, so that you can utilize yoga, whether you choose to use yoga terminology or not, you can utilize the practices of yoga to support your clients. Right. And my somatic psychologist buddies out there, you're in the same boat. We go, it works. We know it works. We've, we feel it and we see it every day. We see the transformation of this thing called the soma, really having a new experience and how quickly that does shift somebody's current presentation, whatever that distress might be as they walked through our door originally. And as we talked about in a number of them, like where, you know, Jolie was applying it directly with people in the office doing nutrition coaching and really helping them get in touch with their body. Dr. Dar Dr. Darcy Lovers was taking this stuff into the art world as well as into mental health clinics and hospitals where she's using this combination again to bring people and meet them where they are, bring them where they wanna go by meeting them right where they are. And so we talked about um, with each of our guests, um, I think every conversation we had talked about really meeting the person where they were. And we can't do that if we can't see that. And we can't see that if we don't have at least enough of the language and enough of our own understanding to truly show up and be present for them. Um, from my world, as I said earlier, you know, I was, I was, in, involved in this stuff when it was really not a thing in the community that I was in. It was just barely coming into the community. It was this new trendy thing. And that's why people were starting to do it. Not because it was this ancient practice that had a lot of validity behind it. Um, it was because it was in the news. And as a result, it was changing people's lives. And for me, because of my experience in, in uh, with Western medicine and my own physical health, I wanted to know why. And when I was asking my medical doctors as I was going through testing, why do you want this? Why is this happening? And the response didn't always match what my personal experience was. And I wanted to understand that more. And that's part of how I end up in psychology because that's what we study. <laughs> People's personal experiences and how they come to do what they do and why they do what they do, which has been a question of mine since I was about five, if you ask my mom. And so, and her response was always, I don't know, Stace. People just do what they do. And I said, I'm gonna find that out. Why do they do what they do? And there is some good research on why we do what we do, both from the epigenetic standpoint and lineage and ancestry and trauma and nervous system states and endocrine system states and neurology, as well as things like the gut microbiome, which we touched on in, in a couple of the sessions, and really, again, being present to ourselves and our own experiences because each experience changes the brain, changes how we go out into the world. So if you feel like this is something that you're really interested in, we are diving deep into what these overlays and these practices are from both the ancient texts, um, the Sanskrit words, as, as Darcy had pointed out in her talk, that Sanskrit is a language of vibration. And it's about the vibration because we know vibration changes us. We, we spoke briefly in one of the sessions around music and sound and how that changes our nervous system and why that's so important. And when we were talking with Joanne, um, lots about her nervous system informed yoga for trauma, how using movement and vibration and being present to the experience in the body makes such a huge difference on how we change as we can both label that from the yoga place for those students who want that language, that they want that understanding. They want to hear the, the repetitive sounds of those chants and those mantras. And it, when you're going into, you know, I used to sometimes go test firefighters. They weren't that interested in the Sanskrit words. You know, they didn't really want that. They wanted the activity. They wanted the movement. They wanted to know that they felt better. Um, we want to be able to meet all of our clients, patients, and, and students where they are with the language they can hear. Yeah, so this, I mean, this program is kind of like I was touching on, a very well-organized 
course where it, you know, the, the information is presented and then there's an embodiment piece where you're going to really integrate the in information into your own personal practice and then te and then how to bring that to your work. Um, and so, you know, there's going to be sequences that are based off of certain conditions, like should you be giving a bunch of backbends to somebody who has high levels of anxiety? And so we're going to use, you know, Stacy's wisdom um, to integrate that into how to provide breath work um, to certain populations, how to provide sequences to certain populations. Um, and yeah, we're really excited. You know, um, anytime we say yes to Svedyaya self-study, uh, the magic always happens. So we are really excited to, again, put this program out into the world uh, so that we can ultimately spread the love of the practice so that we can all, you know, live in our inner brilliance, in our inner joy. And um, and then change the world. And change the world. <laughs> One yoga posture. <laughs> well, thank you so much for uh, being a part of this summit. It's so wonderful to see how many people are interested in this topic. Uh, again, feel free to share this summit with that link that you signed up with. I'll include it in the email. Um, and keep it, if you have any questions, please reach out and the information for the continuing education program will also be below. So. Thanks for watching. Thank you so much for being a part of this summit with us. We had a great time getting it together, bringing it out to you, and it, like Sarah said, putting it out into the world because we think it's very important, very important information and very um, needed in our time. <laughs>